Chapter 8 When I got home, Daryl was gone. Good. I didn't want to deal with his crap. I sat down at my living room table and turned on my laptop. I perused the online jobs ads. I needed something that would start immediately and pay right away so I wouldn't be late on my mortgage. I typed in ASAP in the search box. Several ads came up for Dog Walker. The jobs paid 10 bucks an hour. I wasn't an animal person, but maybe I could fake it. Then again, the dog probably would sense my pretense. So, it probably wouldn't work. I checked out some other ads. An egg donation ad promised to pay seven grand. I clicked on the ad. The medical clinic wanted donors to be under the age of 30. Since I was in my 40s, my eggs were way too old. There was a slew of other ads. Most of them required specialized degrees like accounting or engineering. Others wanted experience. I keyed in some other search terms. I found ads to participate in different studies. I skipped over the ones that involve treatment for health conditions. Since I was in good health, there was no point in wasting my time viewing them. There were several ads to watch and rate video games. Since the last time I had played a video game was over 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't qualify. I found an ad to be mock juror. The gig was scheduled for tomorrow and it offered to pay $90 for an 8-hour day. Not a lot of money, but it was better than nothing. The good thing was that I had met the ad's requirements. I was a U.S. citizen, an adult, and lived in Chatelain County. The ad had an online questionnaire. I completed the form and submitted it. If I were lucky, I'd be picked for the gig. I tried a few more job searches and nothing looked interesting. I got up from my chair and walked into the kitchen. I opened the refrigerator. There was leftover grilled lemon chicken, collard greens, and macaroni and cheese. Those were Daryl's specialties and he knew had to make them just right. I grabbed a plate and utensils from my cupboard. I piled the food on my plate and put it in the microwave. After a few minutes, the food was ready. I took the plate from my microwave and grabbed a bottle of water from my refrigerator. I sat down at my living room table. The food was utterly scrumptious. Maybe I'd keep Daryl after all. The man definitely knew how to cook. I looked at my emails. No new clients. I did a search for the news. The top story in Chatelain was the arrest of Liz. She had been charged with the murders of her husband and Manuel. Why would Liz kill them both? Maybe to cover up her husband's murder. 
or it could be some other reason. It didn't really matter because I wasn't working on her case anymore. I looked at my watch. It was 1.54 p.m. So far, I hadn't made one cent. What a wasted day. I checked my emails again. There was one from the jury service. I opened it. The email read, We appreciate your interest in the mock juror position. Since yesterday, we have received more than 200 applications. We have selected the applicants who are best qualified. Regrettably, you were not selected. We wish the best in your job search. 200 applications for a crappy one day job? God damn it. This job search thing was a lot harder than I thought I looked at my belongings in the living room. Except from my laptop, everything was old. Who'd want to buy a 15-year-old couch with stains on it? Probably no one. I could try selling my car, but I wasn't ready to it give up. I needed my car for my business. My 401k, stocks, and bonds were all gone. Used to them to pay mortgage when business was slow. And now, I had nothing. I prided myself on my mortgage on time. But if I were late on my mortgage, the worst thing would happen is that I would hit with a late penalty. If things got really bad, I could lose my condo. But a foreclosure took a long time. So maybe I should stop panicking. Then again, the prospect of having a foreclosure on my credit record didn't bode well with me. Plus, if I lost my condo, what if I couldn't find a landlord who'd rent to me? God damn it. I needed to stop thinking about the what ifs and focus on something positive. Like finding new clients or getting a job. I yawned. Why was I suddenly tired? Maybe I just needed a nap and then I could focus. I walked into the bedroom and changed into one of Daryl's t-shirts. I loved that they were big and roomy. I crawled into bed and shut my eyes. After a bit, I fell asleep. I looked at my clock on my nightstand. It was 7.07 p.m. I have been asleep for over five hours. I stretched and then got out of bed. I grabbed my favorite jeans and a sweater from my closet. To my chagrin, my jeans were too tight in the waist. I took them off. I went into my closet and pulled out my sewing kit. After I cut some strips of fabric from the waist, I sewed in elastic. I sighed after I put my pants back on. Now, I could breathe. I then brushed my teeth and combed my hair. I took a whiff of the air. Something smelled good. I walked into the kitchen. Daryl was next to the stove. 
he was stirring a pan of chicken, vegetables, and noodles. I smiled. Daryl turned and looked at me. Babe, did you have a nice nap? Yeah, I feel rested. Good. Dinner will ready in a few minutes. What did you today? I asked. I got a haircut because I'm starting the census job on Thursday. I figured I should look nice for the first day. I glanced at Daryl's hair and grinned. Your hair looks great. I'm glad you took the job. Me, too. I'm getting a little bored around here. A new job is always a good thing. I walked next to Daryl and began rubbing his shoulders and neck. Babe, that feels good, he murmured. Does it? Yeah, real good, Daryl said as she turned. He then kissed me hard on the lips. I kissed him back and began tugging at his clothes. The doorbell rang. Ignore it, I whispered. Daryl nodded as he ran his hands up and down my body. The doorbell rang two more times. Babe, they must really want to talk to us. Fine, get the door, then. I said. Daryl walked to the front door and opened it. After a few seconds, he called out. There's a man who wants to see you. About what? I asked. His cousin's case, Daryl answered. Tell him to come in. I said. Daryl and a forty-something man with a laptop bag walked into the living room. The man was tall with salt and pepper hair. He was dressed in a black wool sweater and jeans. A bandage was peeking from the top of his sweater. How can I help you? I asked. My name is Warren Wright Uwood and I'm here about my cousin's case. Who's your cousin? I asked. Liz Polroy. You know she got arrested this morning, Warren answered as he tugged at the top of his sweater. Yeah, I was there when it happened, I said. I know you were helping my cousin, Warren said. Yeah, I was, but not anymore, I responded. I understand that you were concerned about the money. Yeah, I am. Well, I can cover Liz's expenses, he said as he opened his laptop bag. He pulled out five stacks of hundred dollar bills. Here's five grand. Is that enough? My eyes widened when I saw the money. That will cover my expenses for now, I said. Let me get you get a receipt. I walked to my laptop on the table and turned it on. I wrote up an invoice, printed it, and handed it to Warren. So how did you find my home address? I asked. Went by your old office and found it was closed. 
did a little bit online research and found your home address. It wasn't that hard. And what do you for a living? Warren scratched his chest. Repossess cars. You know when folks miss a payment, we track down their cars and repossess them. How's business? I asked. With the recession, it's totally thriving, Warren grinned. So, what's the plan on my cousin's case? What do you know about it? I asked. Warren told me things that Liz had already told me. She said that you wanted to go to Seattle and find Calvin's girlfriend because she could be the killer. When are you going to do that? I looked at my watch. I could try to catch a plane tonight. Warren smiled. That would be good. The sooner we find her, the better it will be for Liz. Warren, can I ask you a question? Sure, Warren asked. Do you think that Liz is innocent? Absolutely, he responded. Calvin and Liz had their problems, but she'd never kill him. Not over a mistress? Warren shook his head. Liz accepted Calvin's affairs as part of their marriage. Can I ask you another question? Did she know Manuel Britton? Warren shook his head. I don't know why the police are blaming her for his murder. She had nothing to with it. All right. Can I ask you another question? What? Warren asked. Liz didn't take Calvin's last name when they married, right? That's right. But I don't understand why that'd make a difference. Polroy is an interesting name. I've never met anyone with that name. Warren smiled. Polroy is Liz's first husband's name. She kept it. Kept it after the divorce? No. After his death, he died in a motorcycle accident. Motorcycle accident? I asked. A big rig hit his motorcycle. The trucker fell asleep while driving. Liz sued the trucking company and got a huge settlement. Sorry for her loss. Was that before or after her aunt died? Aunt? The only aunt Liz has is my mother and she's very much alive. I wanted to tell him that Liz had lied about inheriting money from her aunt, but I knew better. Instead, I said, I must have confused Liz with someone else. Sounds like it, Warren replied. Anyway, have you found a lawyer for Liz? I asked. I'm working on it. Should have one soon, he responded as he scratched his bandage. I glanced at Warren. I wanted to ask him why he was scratching so much. Instead, I asked him for his contact information. 
Warren spouted off his phone number and email address. I then got up from my chair. It was nice meeting you. Same here, he said as he got up from the sofa. Daryl got up also. We escorted Warren to the door. Warren extended his right hand. I took Warren's hand and shook it. I'll let you know what I find in Seattle. Great, Warren said as he turned to exit. Daryl and I said our goodbyes to Warren and shut the door. I turned to Daryl and said, What do you think? Didn't get a good out vibe. Don't like the fact he repossesses cars. Kind of slimy. Plus, what's up with all of his scratching? Maybe he has a nervous tick or something, I responded. Or maybe it has to something with the bandage. Didn't want to ask him because it might have offended him. Yeah, that makes sense, Daryl said. But at least, I got paid. So now, I can work. I said. When are you leaving for Seattle? Daryl asked. In a bit, I answered. I just need to go to the bank and deposit the money. I'll be back in about 15 minutes. Daryl looked directly into my eyes. The bank can wait. I looked back at him and whispered, You really think so? Babe, yeah it can, Daryl whispered back. I smiled as Daryl gently grabbed my hand and pointed to our bedroom's door. Chapter 9 The rain was pounding outside my hotel room window in downtown Seattle. I turned on the light and grabbed my phone from the night table. I turned on the TV and watched the news. There was nothing, which would help me find Veronica. Just a couple of local fires and a gang-related shooting. I booted up my laptop and did a search for Veronica Quainwood on various social media sites. She wasn't on anything. Damn it. Finding out where Veronica celebrated her 40th birthday was going to be a lot harder than I thought. I then did a general search for her and a handful websites came up. A couple confirmed that she was 40 years old and another said she graduated from a local high school. One said she was related to Sarah to Quainwood. After doing a few searches on Sarah to, I found out that she was Veronica's mother. She was 69 years old and lived in a senior citizen's complex in Tacoma, which was about 30 miles from Seattle. I shut down my laptop and put in its bag. I then went into the bathroom and took a quick shower. I brushed my teeth and combed my hair. I went back into my bedroom and pulled out a pair of dark brown wool slacks and a matching sweater from my suitcase. I pulled on my slacks. To my dismay, the top button wouldn't clasp. Damn it, I needed to stop eating Daryl's calorie-laden home-cooked meals. 
Then again, last night, Daryl had shown me how he appreciated my newly gained weight. On a 1 to 10 scale, the sex had been an 11. It was utterly outstanding. What was wrong with outgrowing my clothes? If it kept Daryl happy, it was worth it. I smiled as I pulled off my slacks. I rummaged through my suitcase and found a pair of double-knit black leggings, a long dark gray sweater, and socks. I put them on along with a pair of black boots. Not exactly professional, but at least I felt comfortable. I topped off my outfit with my long dark eggplant purple wool coat. I then grabbed my laptop, purse, and umbrella. I shut off the light and unlocked the door. Outside, the rain was pouring hard. I opened my umbrella and walked quickly to my rental car in the motel's parking lot. Forty-five minutes later, I was in front of Sarada's apartment complex. I circled a couple of times until I found a parking spot on the street. The sky was gray, but it was no longer raining. Instead, there was a light drizzle. I pulled my phone from my purse and checked my messages. Daryl had sent me an I love you text message. I smiled. I then texted him last night was wonderful. There were a couple messages that were unrelated to the case. I put back my phone back inside my purse. I grabbed my laptop. I wanted to leave my umbrella inside the car. However, I took it because the rain could start up again. I got out of my car and locked it. I looked at the complex. There had to be at least 300 apartments. I walked around for a few minutes until I reached Sarada's place. I knocked on the door. No one answered. I knocked again. A woman's voice shouted, Hold on for a minute. I'm coming. After a couple of minutes, an older woman opened the door. She was about five apostrophe seven and slightly plump. Her long waist length hair was mostly gray with a few brownish black strands. Except for two barely visible frown lines across on her forehead. The woman's face was practically in line. I introduced myself. I'm Eric Commuteros and I'm a private investigator. Are you Sarah de Quainwood? The woman nodded. I wanted to talk to you about your daughter Veronica Quainwood. The woman smiled. Please come in, I've been expecting you. I walked inside. The living room's walls were painted a deep orange and the hardwood floor was decorated with several throw rugs. Sarada turned to me. Can I get you anything to drink? No, I'm good. Sarah motioned for me to sit down on her deep rust colored couch. I sat down. She sat down next to me. 
What do you know about the case? I asked. Veronica gave up the baby back when she was in college. I looked at Sarita with a puzzled expression. What baby? Sarita scrunched her face. Aren't you from the adoption agency? No, I'm here about something else. Oh, I'm sorry. I just thought you were. I thought. I thought I would finally meet her. Who? My grandbaby. She'll be turning 22 this year. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm actually investigating the murder of Calvin Norwich. Who's that? Sarah asked. He was an attorney in Chatlin, I answered. I've never heard of him. Well, he was a friend of your daughter's. Really? Sarah exclaimed. She never mentioned him to me. All right, I replied. Do you know where I can find your daughter? Sarah lowered her eyes. She's dead. I'm sorry. I didn't know. It must be hard because she just died so recently. It was four years ago, but it feels like yesterday, Sarada replied in a quiet voice. I must have misheard her. Four years couldn't be right. Ma'am are you sure that it's been that long? Sarada glared at me. I know when my daughter died. All right. Sorry about that. How did she die? Veronica died in a car crash in Chatlin. She was coming home from a party. She had too much to drink. She ran into a tree. Sorry again about your loss. So, I am. But after she died, I went through her belongings. Found out she had a daughter in college. Contacted the adoption agency. They said couldn't release any information to me. However, they would write to my granddaughter to see if she would meet with me. If she wanted to, they'd let me know. When you came to my door, I was hoping that you were with the agency. But I guess I was wrong. Ma'am, I'm sorry I'm not with them, but I need to tell you something else. I think someone is using your daughter's identity. Sarada shook her head. Why would someone do that? To get start over. To do bad things. Like what? Sarada asked. I explained the alleged affair between Calvin and Veronica, his murder and the murder of the Manuel. Now, I'm not saying the person who stole your daughter's identity did these things, but until I talk to her I won't know. Sarah to put her hands over her face. Oh my god, I can't believe this is happening. Ma'am, do you know anyone who would pretend to be your daughter? No, I don't. Sarah answered. 
Are you sure? I asked. Absolutely, Sarada said with conviction. Again, I'm sorry about your daughter, I said as I pulled my business card my wallet and handed to her. Ma'am, if you think of anything else, please let me know. Sarah nodded as she took my card. We then said our goodbyes. I walked back to my car. I sighed. Why would someone impersonate Veronica? Did Calvin know her real name? And what about Veronica's render? Did she know the truth? If she had, why did she tell me that Veronica was in Seattle? Was it some sort of trick? After I checked out of my hotel, I would be flying back to Chatlin. When I got there, my next stop would be to see Veronica's render. Hopefully, with a little monetary persuasion, she'd give me some real answers. Chapter 10 When I arrived at Veronica's house mid-afternoon, the driveway was vacant. I walked up to the door and knocked several times. There was no answer. Damn it, I needed to see Veronica's render. Where was she? She could be at work, at a park, or somewhere else. The problem was I had no idea what the name of the renter was. So, there was no way I could locate her. I walked around to the side of the house. There was a small window about six feet above the ground. The window had no curtains or blinds. I got up on my tippy toes and looked inside. To my dismay, the house was completely vacant. No furniture. No appliances. Nothing at all. Where did Veronica and her render go? I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turn around and saw a slender man with a receding hairline. He was about my height and in his late thirties. He wasn't handsome, but he wasn't ugly either. Why are you peeking into the house? He asked. I'm Eric Commuteros and I'm a private investigator. I was trying to find somebody. The man's thin eyebrows arched. Private investigator? What are you investigating? The murder of Calvin Norwich, I replied in a matter of fact tone. Calvin Norwich, he was that big time eviction lawyer. Thought they said his wife did it. You can't believe everything they say. Anyway, I was looking for this lady. She's Veronica's render. The man looked at me with a dumbfounded expression. Veronica doesn't have a renter. She lived here by herself. Are you sure? I asked. Positive, the man answered. And who are you? I'm her neighbor. What's your name? Brad Chadut, he replied. How long have you known Veronica? For about three years, Brad answered. 
I crossed my arms. A few days ago, there was a woman who answered the door. She was this older lady with bad teeth and hair. Kind of chubby. She told me she rented from Veronica. Brad smiled. Sounds like one of her characters. Whose character? I asked. Veronica's. She likes to dress up as different people. You know old ladies, fat people, whatever. I winced. So, the lady I saw was Veronica? Brad nodded. Yup, Veronica's not fat or old. Brad shook his head and pulled out his phone. He showed me a photo and pointed. That's Veronica. I glanced at the photo. Veronica looked nothing like the woman had met. She had an athletic build with long dark hair and a nice smile. When was this photo taken? I asked. A few months ago, Brad answered. But when Veronica puts on old lady makeup and a fat suit, she looks totally different. Is Veronica an actress? I asked. That's what she wanted to be when she was younger. Never made it in the movies or anything like that. It was just a little hobby for her. That's interesting. What did Veronica do professionally? I think she does marketing. Where? I asked. She's been out of work for a while. She was hoping to get this one job, but it fell through. Are you and Veronica good friends? Friends? Yeah, you could say that. Do you two have a relationship? Brad shook his head. Me and Veronica? That would never happen. And why not? Brad gave me an annoyed look. Because I'm not into women. Sorry for the inference, I said in a sheepish voice. No worries, Brad responded. Brad did Veronica tell you who she was dating? I asked. Veronica was terrible with men. Always picking the wrong dude. There was the fat guy who was cheap. He used to split the bill with her and make her pay half even though he would eat twice as much as her. Then there was the good-looking dude who would floss his teeth at the restaurant table. Poor girl. Did Veronica tell you that she was seeing Calvin Norwich? Who told you that crap? His wife, I answered. She's full of it. Veronica was a good girl. She didn't sleep with married men. And you're sure she never told you about Calvin? Not one word, Brad answered. Brad, I need to tell you something. What? Veronica is dead. Brad's face turned gray. Veronica's dead? Oh my god, I just saw her this morning. 
She was moving. Moving where? Don't know. She didn't tell me. How did Veronica die? In a car accident, I replied. When this happened? Brad asked. Four years ago, I answered. Brad's face became twisted. Are you kidding me? That's impossible. I told you I just saw her. Someone stole the real Veronica's identity and has been pretending to be her for all these years. That's horrible, Brad said with disdain in his voice. So, do you know what her real name was? I asked. Brad shook his head. Nope, I've always known her as Veronica. Are you sure? I asked. 100%, Brad replied. Do you think that the lady could have killed Calvin Norwich? I asked. The Veronica that I knew was kind and sweet. If she stole an identity, so what? That doesn't make her a killer. Are you sure? I asked. Thieves and killers are of different breeds, Brad replied. If that's case, why would Veronica suddenly disappear after Calvin was murdered? I asked. Because her house was in foreclosure, Brad answered. She got a sheriff's notice and they were coming out later tomorrow to lock her out. So, she moved. I raised my eyebrows. Foreclosure? Was Calvin Norwich the lawyer for the bank? Don't know. Brad answered. I pulled a $20 bill from my purse and waved it at Brad. Can you tell me where Veronica is? Brad glared at me. Look lady, told you before I don't know. I could take your money and lie, but that wouldn't be right. I put my money back into my purse, pulled out my business card, and handed it to Brad. If you hear from Veronica, let me know. Brad nodded. I doubt I will. But if I do, I will tell her that you dropped by. But like I said before, Veronica is innocent. She didn't do it. After I said goodbye, I turned and walked back to my car. I wasn't so sure Brad was right about Veronica's innocence. With the foreclosure, she certainly had motive. But when I had looked at the court docket online, I didn't remember seeing Veronica's name. Maybe I had missed it for some reason or the case was under her real name. I needed to find something that linked Veronica to the crime. I then had a terrible thought. If Veronica hadn't killed Calvin, my client had to be the perp.